Good afternoon and welcome to the National Museum of Women in the Arts. I am Katie Watt, the museum's deputy director, chief curator, and we are all gathered here this afternoon to meet Cecilia Alemani. The museum's Creatives Keynote series is an invitation to meet dynamic people, artists, curators, collectors, thinkers, whose practice enfolds our museum's mission for equity in the arts. In September 2022, I visited the most recent iteration of the Venice Biennale, The Milk of Dreams, which I fear has ruined all future biennales for me. <laughs> Venice is pretty much inarguably the most influential art exhibition on the planet. And I saw there in 2022 art made predominantly by women artists and non-binary artists. This was a true flipping of the script compared to past iterations of the Biennale. And I thought, we must invite the marvelous person who developed this incredible exhibition, curator Cicile Alemani, to the museum. And here she is. Alemani is based in New York City. She is the Donald R. Mullen director and curator of the public art program that is presented on the High Line, that magnificent elevated park and greenway along the lower west side of uh, Manhattan. In 2022, as I mentioned, Alemani curated the 59th Venice Biennale. She was only the fifth woman to do so in that exhibition's 129 year history. On view in New York City right now is an exhibition that Alemani curated with the Shah Garg Foundation. It is called Making Their Mark, featuring 80 women artists from the last eight decades. Our staff has seen it. Maureen, I think you were the first one. Um, it is a knockout. Please, if you can, see it before it closes later this month. And next year, Alemani will curate the venerable site Santa Fe. This will be her first biennial project within the United States. Before I invite Cecilia to the podium, I want to thank the folks who made the, today's event possible. This exciting program is supported by leadership gifts from Denise Littlefield Sobel and the Davis Dare Family Fund with additional support provided by Ann and Edwards. And I think Ann is with us today. And thank you, Ann, for being here. The Ravada Foundation of the Logan Family and the Susan and Jim Swartz Public Programs Fund. We are so grateful to each of them. When Cecilia is finished with her presentation, she will be glad to take a few questions from us. My colleagues will be ready with microphones for you. If anybody remembers Phil Donahue, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and our team will also let you know where to head next within the museum to enjoy a scrumptious dinner and lively conversation to celebrate Cecilia's work and today's program. Please help me welcome to the National Museum of Women in the Arts, Cecilia Alemani. Thank you so much for the uh, kind invitation and thank you all for being here today. Uh, I'm very excited and thrilled to be uh, here and I want to uh, thank the museum. I'm so excited to see the new museum reopening its beauty and the amazing collections upstairs. Uh, I'd like to thank the entire team at the museum, the board of trustees, uh, Susan Fisher Serling and Katie Watt and the entire and all of you for being here. Um, I, today I want to focus on a number of projects which I had the honor of curating in the last 10 years, which uh, um, featured uh, women artists in very, very different contexts. And I think as we are in March celebrating Women's Month, the best way to celebrate this month is to share with you uh, the work of um, amazing artists that I had uh, the honor of working with uh, and I hope will accompany also uh, my trajectory as a curator for uh, many years to come. Um, as you heard um, from Katie, I work at the High Line. For those of you who are not familiar with the High Line, uh, the High Line is a a gorgeous elevated park in New York City. Uh, it was built on an old elevated uh, railroad that was built in the 1930s. Uh, it was abandoned in the uh, 1980s and turned and transformed into a public park in the, uh, early, in the late 2009. Um, I have been working for um, Friends of the Highland, which is the nonprofit organization that supports uh, the park for 
12 years, so I joined a couple of years after the uh, opening of the, uh, the park, and I oversee the public art program, which means as you walk on the park, you will encounter lots of sculptures and murals and uh, billboards and different art interventions, and those are kind of under my, uh, my leadership. And you know, since the opening of the park, we've, um, we've shown the work of over 60% uh, of the program was uh, dedicated to women and gender non-conforming artists. Um, and as I started working there in the early uh, 2011, I was very uh, interested in also thinking about not just the Highland as a sort of relic of another, um, another um, time, but uh, as, uh, as, as a place that is very much embedded into the, um, into the neighborhood of Chelsea and especially into the waterfront. So if you locate the Highland, it's in Chelsea, so very close to the Hudson River. And there is a very interesting history there, uh, which is very much uh, an artist, has artistic roots. Uh, lots of artists use the waterfront, in particular in the 70s and 80s, when many of the piers that were uh, on the uh, waterfront were completely abandoned. Um, and so as I started working on the history of the neighborhood, I came across an exhibition that was titled uh, Pier 18. Uh, Pier 18 was actually a very peculiar exhibition. Uh, it was a project by a gentleman called Willow B. Sharp, who was a very influential artist and curator, um, kind of an art impresario that worked downtown in the 70s. Uh, some of you might know him for a very important uh, art journal that he created called Avalanche. Um, but he was really someone that animated the downtown scene, embracing in particular um, sort of uh, conceptual and performance artists. Uh, so he invited a group of uh, 27 artists on Pier 18. Pier 18 was not exactly where the Highland is, it was a few blocks downtown, uh, but it was an abandoned pier, and he invited these artists that you see on the screen to carry out performances and uh, uh, events and actions that uh, were not meant to be uh, shared with the public, but they were meant to be photographed uh, and then displayed as a series of black and white photographs. So here you see uh, a couple of examples of artists that were just starting at that time. You can see this beautiful piece uh, by John Baldessari, and every artwork was sort of accompanied by a set of instructions. So you can see hands framing New York Harbor, uh, and then uh, here you have Alan Ruppersberg, who um, wanted to pay homage to Udini uh, by uh, bringing a, a suitcase filled of bricks uh, and then throw it in the Hudson River, or someone like Vito Conci, who uh, did his, one of his very first following pieces. Uh, and so as you can uh, see, uh, these were great examples of kind of ephemeral interventions, uh, which were captured by a duo of photographers called uh, Shank Kender, and then exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art as a series of black and white uh, pictures. Uh, but what you'd notice also in the list of artists that you saw at the beginning, uh, these artists were all male artists. Uh, and it's still quite um, shocking to think about doing a full exhibition in New York City downtown in the 70s without not even including an art, like a woman artist, especially working in performance art since there were so many. Uh, so as a sort of act of revision and uh, an exercise of reenactment, uh, one of my very first projects on the Highland was um, a reenactment of this exhibition. And it took place on this abandoned pier, which is called Pier 54, which you can see from the Highland. And uh, um, this time I invited 27 artists, all women, <laughs> Um, to, to kind of follow the same rules. So not uh, uh, to set actions and gestures and performances uh, that were not meant to be seen by the public, but they were captured by a uh, photographer. Um, the pier itself was uh, quite fantastic. As I mentioned, um, these piers, especially here in the Meatpacking District in Chelsea, were used so much in the 70s and 80s by a large community, community of artists and performers and art lovers who uh, either used this abandoned architecture uh, to hang out, uh, to do 
different legal and illegal activities, uh, but also as outdoor studios and incredible stages where they could set their, uh, their pieces. Uh, and so that was a very important part for me as I, as I was starting you know, to think about the High Line. Uh, this is a picture of the pier, which unfortunately is no longer there. Uh, but the artists um, decided to uh, approach this project with very different interventions. So, so I'm gonna show you a selection of them. If you're curious, then you can see them all on the High Line website. Um, Latoya Ruby Fraser, who is an amazing uh, photographer, for instance, was interested in uh, sort of um, recuperating the history of uh, the waterfront as it interconnect, interconnected with uh, the history of immigration in New York City. So uh, she worked with historical uh, images that then she printed on these large scale white uh, flags and then she staged them as a sort of site of memory uh, and recollection. Or uh, someone, uh, a number of artists instead, wanted to sort of uh, quote this idea of uh, this part of the city as a, also as a sort of, not necessarily a party scene, but a place where people uh, could let go and have fun, like Margaret Lee, who invited a famous drag queen called Vivacious to sort of resurrect in the history also of cruising, um, and so staged these uh, uh, pictures on, at sunset, um, and so did also someone like uh, Xavier Simons, who is another um, really um, talented photographer who um, shot um, five dancers recreating scenes uh, from historical photographs uh, found by the artist when she was doing the research on the history of uh, the peers, are site of um, different kinds of experimentation. Um, Sharon Hayes, who is a wonderful artist uh, um, who has uh, engaged with the history, of course, of feminism, um, invited many of her collaborators and friends to write this sort of feminist motto uh, with uh, chalk on the surface of the pier, uh, women of the world unite, so they say. Uh, and then uh, we rented, we, we got a lift on a helicopter to take this uh, great aerial picture. So here you can see very well what you know, the, the landscape from the water is. Um, and other artists then did also more uh, you know, lighter interventions, someone like Marie Lorenz, who has this uh, really um, special project called um, Tide and Current Taxi, uh, where she builds her own canoes and then she takes them in the river, which is between legal and illegal, uh, but, um, and then invited people to join her as she kind of um, discovered the waterfront from the perspective of the water, kind of going under the, the pier itself, which is uh, almost a piece of uh, industrial archaeology. Um, Jill Majid, who is also a conceptual artist uh, working um, today, uh, wrote a postcard to each of the artists of the original Pier 18. Um, this was a letter to William Wegman, and then she uh, sort of uh, tossed them into the water. Um, so, and then continuing, this was a very uh, sweet intervention by artist Carol Beauvais, who invited all the other artists in the show to uh, have tea and have coffee and maybe a drink uh, on the pier um, and sharing experiences and life stories. Uh, and then finally, someone like Andra Usuta, who uh, is an artist from um, Romania, who did a sort of digital intervention in one of the photos in which you see a giant head hand like kind of erasing the pier. And that was kind of, um, it was probably a vision of what was coming up next. In fact, the pier was demolished the following year to make space to what is now called Little Island, which is a new sort of uh, architectural feature on the, on, the, on the Hudson River. It's a sort of floating garden. Um, and, uh, um, and it's uh, there right now if you wanna visit it. 
Um, what we did then with these photographs, like we, what happened with Pier 18, we installed an exhibition in a gallery in Chelsea and had uh, more than 200 pictures hanging on the walls. And to me, this was uh, not only a sort of way of celebrating um, the artists that we were working with, but also as they uh, were helping us saving the memories of this incredible uh, waterfront and uh, part of New York City that was um, going to disappear very soon. Um, so the second project I wanna talk to you about is a completely different project, which uh, is uh, uh, much more recent. The, the project I just showed you, Pier 54, happened exactly 10 years ago. Uh, this is instead a project that is currently on view in New York City. Katie just mentioned it, uh, and it's another way um, I tried to um, celebrate the talent of women artists. Uh, it is a group exhibition called Making Their Mark, uh, and it is a, a exhibition of a foundation called Shah Garger Foundation, which uh, focuses mostly on supporting women uh, in the arts. Um, this was a very different challenge as a curator. It's the first time I was actually uh, invited to curate a, an exhibition out of a private collection. Uh, but it was a very interesting exercise in, uh, in um, understanding the different stories that uh, one could say out of the same uh, collection. So um, the... The person that owns the collection, Komal Shah, is uh, uh, someone that has been uh, collecting for a few, for a couple of decades, and her collection is mostly focused on um, work by women artists, and she approached me with the idea of uh, curating the first presentation of this collection on the, uh, in the East Coast. She's usually based uh, in the Bay Area. Um, and uh, I had this incredible job of, uh, you know, telling a story out of a collection that uh, was focused on women artists, but also was focused on telling different stories of abstractions and uh, friendships and um, connections between different artists. Uh, so the exhibition included over uh, 90 works by 80 women artists, starting from uh, a piece by uh, Janet Sobol from 1946 to uh, contemporary uh, works. Uh, one of the key component, uh, components of this exhibition was um, a inter intergenerational dialogues among different, um, different uh, life and different practices. Um, here you see uh, one of the first rooms in the exhibition that features a, a major piece uh, by uh, John Mitchell together with a younger artist like uh, Mary Weatherford and Lorna Simpson. So thinking about uh, abstraction uh, through the lens of not just subjectivity, but also a political lens. Uh, and in particular, I was very interested in creating, again, this um, dialogue between uh, the work of many emerging artists who are exploring abstraction in uh, innovative ways with a group of their significant predecessors uh, who very often anticipated issues of uh, representations, identity, uh, and power, and who were often uh, set aside from the regular uh, or marginalized from the regular art history. So this is a sort of uh, dynamic and uh, tension that animates this exhibition in which uh, um, you have fairly unusual uh, pairing, maybe that wouldn't necessarily be allowed in a museum, but uh, in, uh, in which we try to, to look at also this group of artists as a very cohesive um, group based on affinities and, uh, and dialogues. Um, I'm just gonna show you some other slides. So this is a following room in which um, artists mostly from uh, the California light and space movement like Mary Kors uh, are in dialogue with also fiber artists like Lenore uh, Tony. The collection features a, a wide group of fiber artists um, that uh, I wanted to put at the, um, at the center uh, because for so many 
uh, decades, they've been also put aside. Uh, and uh, um, as, at the same time, you have also uh, works by very young artists, like the, the work that you see in the corner, which is the same artist that in the Pier 54 exhibition did the hand erasing the pier. This is Andro Suta, and for those of you who came to Venice, you might remember this, uh, this object, uh, which are these kind of cyborgian forms in which she kind of um, casts her own body in these uh, crystal shapes. Um, and then the exhibition continues in um, putting together a dialogue between uh, different forms of abstraction, um, in particular artists such as uh, Jacqueline Humphreys or Laura Owens, who thinks of abstraction through the lens of the digital. So as you can see uh, in this painting, for instance, someone like Jacqueline Humphreys is thinking of the actual, or of the, of is thinking to the act of painting, but through um, a digital kind of filter. So all of her paintings are actually realized by using, for instance, uh, stencils that have been digitally realized. Uh, and to me, every time I look at her work, I think of pixels or the noise of uh, a TV or a computer screen. And so I wanted to put her and works like Laura Owens uh, in dialogue with uh, works that are extremely pre-digital, um, and they are based on handcraft, uh, but they, in a way, evoke similar uh, concerns. So you can see to the right, the pink uh, piece is a very important piece by Howardina Pindell, uh, who is uh, uh, an incredible artist who has worked with abstraction for several decades, but always through the sort of handmade by using these hole punches that are then glued on the canvas or next to her, uh, you can see this beautiful example of, of a quilt from the 1970s and across on the room, you have an example of an artist like um, Faith Ringold, who we all, also there is an amazing example of downstairs in the museum, uh, but who is someone that we often associate with um, storytelling or with uh, figurative quilts, but she also made these incredible um, abstract compositions. Uh, so again, thinking about how we can think about abstraction, not necessarily as a kind of neutral um, medium, but also as, uh, as a medium and a platform that can open different interpretations and different meanings, uh, especially when it com comes to uh, art history. Um, and then in this room, sort of continuing thinking about this idea of almost zooming in into a painting, like this beautiful example of a Jennifer Bartlett that you see uh, on the left, the blue piece, in which she clearly address also her relationship with minimalism by using these repetitive forms and the grid, but also sort of zooming in in a painting to kind of highlight almost the uh, pixelation of this, uh, of this work. So in a way, this, uh, this section of the show brought together uh, um, artists that on one side deal with the computer screen and on the other side with the loom. So the same kind of patterns and repetition appear. Um, in the middle, you see an exquisite uh, example of uh, a sculptor called Simon Lee, who I hope you all saw uh, her amazing exhibition that was just on view at the Earshon until, I believe, just last week. And so Simon introduces a, a sort of new chapter in the exhibition, which is um, thinking about how we can think of figuration through the lens of abstraction. Um, the second floor of the exhibition completely uh, expands on this. So as a, as a curator, one of the challenges was how to think of um, figuration, pictures of bodies through the lens of abstraction. So in this room, um, I put together um, artists that are thinking of figuration, are portraying figuration, but from within. So when you see, um, it's a bit hard to see, but you can see it, there is a, a pink painting on the wall with a greenish figure that is a very important painting in the collection by Maria Lasnig, who was a very influential artist from Austria who uh, talked about her paintings as body awareness paintings. So she always portrayed either her own body or other people's body, but always through a lens of the very personal subjectivity. So she, she said 
famously that she wasn't painting what she saw either in a photograph or in a model, but the way she felt her body maybe against the floor as she was painting on the floor or squished against the wall. So this is why these perspectives are quite uh, distorted and very special. And the same sort of um, investigation continues in someone like John Samuel, which is the large painting in the middle, uh, where you can see that she's basically pho photographing her own body from very specific perspective, almost uh, as though she was taking a picture uh, from her face down. And she often portrays her own body aging. Uh, and uh, this is a very important piece it's from the 1980s. So these historical paintings were put uh, in context or in dialogue with uh, contemporary artwork with someone like Christina Quarles that you see in the far left corner, uh, a young artist from LA who often depicts these distorted bodies that are trying to escape the canvas and stretch over the borders, or someone like Cecily Brown to the far uh, right that uh, also uh, kind of works at this thin um, line between abstraction and figuration in this very carnal and visceral uh, paintings. And then someone like Carol Bovet, this uh, sculpture in the foreground, who is an artist that works mostly in abstraction and mostly with very masculine sculptures, uh, but in this case, like by bending these very uh, hard um, pipes of steel, uh, but this time painting them in a very sensual color. So to me, every time I look at this sculpture, I think of, of a sort of distorted body. Um, and so uh, the exhibition then continues uh, thinking about artists that have um, sort of used the like the lens of abstraction to uh, portray people, portray their heroes. Uh, they're both um, imaginary and real. Uh, here you have a very large uh, example of a piece by uh, Firelay Baez, who is an artist from the Dominican Republic, who portrayed two um, Haitian princesses uh, as though they were like uh, the queens that um, should be hung on the wall of a, a royal Haitian palace, uh, or someone like Barbara Chase Ribot, who uh, is an amazing artist, an American artist who lives in Paris, who uh, for many, many uh, decades has created these very sensual uh, sculptures that are often um, dedicated to people that are memorial. This is, in this case, is, uh, dedicated to uh, Malcolm X. And where you can see the top part is made of, um, <clears throat> it's made of uh, bronze, uh, and the bottom part is this cascade of uh, gorgeous sensual silk uh, threads, kind of turning upside down the normal logic of a monument where you have the heavy or more masculine part at the bottom and the more uh, feminine one at the top. Um, then the show continues and I'm gonna run through. So uh, these are uh, works that, as I mentioned before, uh, focus also on what for many, many decades has been defined craft, uh, which, uh, or like low art or less important secondary art. Uh, the collection features a large uh, amount of craft, what were defined craft works, uh, which actually had a very center piece in the show. So this long orange piece is by an artist from Switzerland called uh, Françoise Grossen, uh, who made this piece in the 1970s. Uh, and as uh, uh, often our preconception when we think about I mean, not maybe not this room, but when many people think about craft, they think of something that is made domestically, maybe sitting on an armchair, uh, that is always quite small. Instead, she clearly wanted to play with the scale and repetition uh, and seriality of the minimalist language of the 1970s and of probably her colleagues, uh, but by playing with very uh, kind of everyday materials like this uh, naval kind of um, ropes that she uh, knotted in this uh, funny formation in the middle of the room, or someone like Miriam Shapiro, this kind of fan uh, um, um, orange piece that is hanging here, and she has an amazing piece also upstairs, downstairs, sorry, I don't know why I keep thinking we're on the ground floor. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and so again, thinking about artists that um, have been incredibly important into not just the feminist movement, but also uh, into 
reinscribing a certain kind of art, which is um, often considered to be domestic, uh, into, um, into the sort of a major art history. Um, I'm going to skip to this presentation. These are a series of uh, quite exquisite ceramic pieces by um, Toshiko Takaezu, who is an American artist of Japanese origin that you see on this sort of uh, large platform. Um, it was a, somehow, um, I was trying to, to create a sort of landscape of forms, thinking about also abstraction through uh, sculptural forms. And to me, these are uh, incredible constructions that she made. Uh, they're called enclosed forms. They're these very beautiful organic shapes that only have a little hole uh, at the top uh, to let the gas of the firing process escape. But to me, they're also almost abstract painting on their own. Uh, and then you have also a couple of examples of incredible textile pieces that uh, also continue this, this sort of uh, um, reinscription of uh, craft into the um, art history. Those are two artists I, for instance, did not <coughs> know, uh, two groom Pretz and Kei Sekimachi. There were, she was a German artist who moved to the uh, States to flee the war in, 19, in the 1940s uh, and then went, to, went on to teach at Black Mountain College and made these incredible uh, sculptures out of a traditional loom. So again, thinking about using a traditional uh, means like the loom and really uh, bringing it to a different life uh, in uh, the three-dimensional sphere. Or someone like Casey Kimachi, which is this other kind of hanging piece uh, in which she started using a loom, but with monofilament, so with kind of nylon threads, so creating this incredibly organic, almost like oceanic uh, creatures uh, hanging in the space and, uh, again, updating and upgrading the traditional medium of a uh, loom. Um, and so the exhibition is uh, on view for two more weeks and uh, uh, it will travel to other venues, but if you happen to be in New York in the next couple of weeks, don't miss it. It's in Chelsea, it's in the old Dia building on 22nd Street, uh, and I must say that um, one of the most rewarding <laughs> aspects of doing this exhibition was <clears throat> the, not only the amount of people that came through the show, thinking this is not an existing institution, it's just a space that we rented for this show, uh, but we've also been organizing talks, like this one today, uh, with many artists, um, and they had an incredible attendance, like 700, 800 people that came through the doors. And it's, uh, it's not just a self-compliment, but it's, it's, it's really like a way of, of seeing how much interest there is for this kind of presentations and the occasion of hearing the artists speak uh, and uh, it, it's been really incredible. And so, um, as I imagine, one of the questions might come later is, there is, is there still need of this kind of shows? The answer is probably yes, but I'm not gonna anticipate what you might uh, ask me later. So now I, I'm gonna focus on um, the exhibition that you've heard in the introduction. Let me just uh, take a sip of water uh, and uh, um, as a sort of culmination of uh, these many interests of mine. Um, so I had the honor of curating the uh, last edition of the Venice Biennale, which took place in 2022. And uh, um, as you probably know, the Venice Biennale is the most, uh, the oldest biennial in the world. It was uh, founded in 1983, the first biennial happened in, sorry, in 1893. Uh, the first biennial happened in 1895. Um, it was uh, um, the idea of a, the mayor of Venice at that point who wanted to sort of um, bring the new to Venice. So Venice was already a place uh, where people would go, an amazing uh, city, a museum without walls, 
uh, but he felt like he could use some uh, regeneration. So he kind of invented this uh, um, exhibition by uh, sort of copying or in being inspired by the model of uh, the international expositions of the uh, 19th century. Uh, and so um, the edition I did was um, in the, the 59th edition. So it happens every two years, but it has kept a few years during the wars and during other, and, and in COVID time. And it takes place in two main venues. So the main uh, space that you're seeing behind me is what is called the central pavilion, uh, which is the original pavilion that was built in the uh, 1895. It had gone to lots of renovations, but not as pretty as this one and your museum, because I can tell you there are plenty of leaks and uh, issues, but uh, it is actually the same uh, structure. Uh, and the, the, the Biennale is, uh, is um, uh, structured in a main exhibition, which a, a guest curator in this case myself, curates. It's called the International Art Exhibition. And then there are uh, several national pavilions. Those are outside of my, uh, my scope, but the whole experience is called uh, the Venice Biennale. And as you walk through this uh, uh, space, it, you find yourself surrounded by art from uh, all over the world. Um, and uh, I had also the challenge of doing this exhibition in the middle of the pandemic. I was nominated in January 2020, so I had maybe six weeks of normal life, and then everything ended. Um, and the show was postponed, but in a way, um, I was away. Um, it was a, such a unique time, and I try to really absorb this time into uh, the exhibition. Uh, but the exhibition was called The Milk of Dreams. It was inspired by a, an amazing artist, a woman artist that you see here on the left. Her name is Leonora Carrington. She was a surrealist artist from the UK who um, escaped, fled the war in the 1940s and relocated in Mexico City. And she spent most of her life then until she passed in the early 2010. Uh, and uh, I have always been very interested in surrealism in general, um, but as probably many of you in the room, I studied surrealism when surrealism was just a male affair. I never ever studied a female artist uh, in the surrealism. Of course, I was fascinated by, uh, by Dali, by Miro and Max Ernst, but I couldn't probably, you know, 30 years ago, I couldn't name a female artist. Uh, and that was, of course, uh, a big problem because there are actually amazing surrealist artists working today uh, and working back in the 1920s and 30s when surrealism was uh, founded. Um, and so I was uh, um, looking for an inspiration for my exhibition. And as I often do, I uh, started reading artist books and artist writings, which I always think is sort of a way into an artist's practice. And Leonora Carrington is not just an amazing um, painter and artist, but also an incredible writer. She wrote fantastic novels and short stories, uh, which I knew, but then I found this uh, little book that you see in the middle, which is called The Milk of Dreams. And what The Milk of Dreams uh, is, is a collection of stories for kids that she wrote herself. Uh, and she wrote first on the walls of her apartment in Mexico City, uh, when she had two uh, small kids, uh, and then she collected them in a little booklet that was um, called, again, The Milk of Dreams. And I wanted to use this title and the sort of atmosphere of the book to sort of talk about an exhibition that was focused on um, on ideas of metamorphosis and transformation, uh, which were sort of the, the themes I was thinking of. And at that point, Leonora Carrington became almost like a, a companion into a journey of um, metamorphosis. This book talks about very um, incredible creatures that are hybrid between human and animal and weird machines, celebrating a world where everybody can be different uh, and where the definitions of the human are always a challenge. So um, it, it, it took a long time to get to this uh, theme and to this uh, title, but uh, it came together in a way also as a celebration of 
her own work and that of many of her colleagues. Um, as, a, as you can imagine, one of the most direct um, effect of the pandemic on, on my research was that I couldn't travel. So I, I did one trip, one research trip to uh, Scandinavia and then uh, for two years I sat in my little office, not really an office, but a room in my apartment and I talked to hundreds and hundreds of artists via Zoom because that was the only thing that I could do. I couldn't do studio visits because of the pandemic, I couldn't travel. Uh, and so this very weird um, moments of sharing with people that I never met before uh, and that uh, I could only see through the mediation of the screen uh, became very um, important in the making of the show. So on one side, of course, not being able to walk into an artist studio uh, is terrible because as a curator, you want to be in a room, smelling the paint, touching the sculptures, feeling it. And I couldn't do any of that, especially you know, via Zoom, it's quite frustrating to look at art. But on the other side, I was able to have uh, very inspiring conversations. They became almost confessional moments in which we were sharing lots of anxieties and uh, preoccupations of what was happening. And remember, now it's, uh, it's, uh, it happens to me too, it's easy to forget what those initial months of the pandemic were, but this was all pre-vaccine, uh, pre, you know, lots of these artists had lost, you know, exhibitions, had lost even their studios. So they, nobody, I didn't know if this exhibition was going to happen. So the only thing that we could do was really to, uh, to talk and to, and to share this moment, this very existential moment of anxieties um, and, and complications. So um, more and more, the more I was talking to artists, the more I could, share with them and they could share with me similar concerns and questions that kept arising and that you see here on the screen uh, and that had a, a very sort of philosophical uh, nature or DNA to them. It was less about the art they were making, it was more about the status of, of the world. So uh, how is the definition of the human changing? Uh, what constitute life and what are the differences between um, the natural and the more artificial uh, life? And what are our responsibilities towards uh, the planet? And what would life look like without us? And so these kind of preoccupations fed the sort of main themes of the exhibition, which uh, was sort of centered around these three uh, themes. First of all, the uh, representation of bodies and their metamorphosis. Uh, second, the relationship with, um, between bodies and technologies. Uh, and in this particular case, I'm thinking of how uh, even before the pandemic, we kind of felt this sort of uh, polarity between um, sort of uh, a belief in technology and science to advance our bodies and advance our world, but then on the other side, the sort of fear of a sort of machine takeover. And this sort of polarity or uh, ambivalence was something that during the pandemic got even uh, exacerbated in the idea that uh, in those moments in which we, we needed to be together with the others, we couldn't be with our families, we couldn't be with our friends, and the only way of being together was through the screen, through technology, through the phone, through the computer. And so again, technology became something that brought us together but also uh, kept us apart. And then finally, the connection between uh, bodies and the earth and how many artists have been thinking about issues of um, ecology and you know, nature and also other forms of life. Um, so I'm going to show you a, a few images of the exhibition, uh, which included 213 artists, as you've heard. Uh, the majority of the artists were women artists and gender non-conforming artists. It was about... 85%, uh, um, we can talk about it later, why? <laughs> um, but it was, of course, it wasn't necessarily just, uh, you know, I wasn't necessarily obsessed with numbers. It came uh, quite naturally, but it came also uh, intentionally uh, as a gesture to, uh, as a rupture with the past. Uh, most of the most recent biennial, not to talk about the one from the early 20th century, but I feature mostly 20 or 30% uh, women artists in the show, which I just think is not uh, a realistic uh, 
portrait of our society. Um, but um, it was, of course, a very international uh, exhibition that featured over um, 58 uh, nations, uh, and there were many uh, new productions. Um, the exhibition starts or started with this uh, green elephant on a pedestal. Uh, this is a work by an artist from Germany called Katharina Fritsch. Um, and this is the only sort of historical room that has remained in the Venice Biennale. But imagine back in the uh, 20th century, especially you know, in the uh, 20s and 30s, the entire Venice Biennale was decorated like this. We had frescoes and wallpaper and furniture. Now we're so used to seeing art in uh, the kind of cold white spaces of our white cubes, which of course we love, but it's also incredible to think that uh, just less than a century ago, it was completely normal to see art under uh, under the uh, you know other other artists' work. So I wanted to start the exhibition with a gen with a this sort of um, large um, sculpture of an elephant because. Uh, I have always loved the work of Katharina Fritsch. She's a hyper She's a she's a, an artist that works in um, sculpture, mostly making hyper realistic sculptures uh, that have always something off, something weird, something strange. Maybe it's the size or the scale of it. I think it's uh, here the Irshon. You have the the blue chicken. The, the amazing outdoor piece, uh, but this was a way for me. And so in this case, the scale is correct. It's an actual elephant, but it's, uh, it's painted green. So there is something very surreal or super real in this uh, presentation. But I wanted to start by, um, I wanted to start the exhibition by positioning an animal instead of a uh, man or like a person on a pedestal as a sort of uh, act of rethinking what is it that we uh, celebrate on pedestal and plinth. Uh, you would enter the main room of the uh, pavilion, had a um, conversation between uh, two artists. The sculptures are, uh, again, my friend Andrew Suta. Uh, these are incredible crystal sculptures that show um, kind of uh, cyborgian beings. They're often cast of her bodies where her body then intersect with appendixes that are not human. They can be objects, they can be some weird animals, but they're quite exquisite in the making and uh, quite seductive at the same time. So the idea of the cyborg was also quite important in the show. Uh, and then on the walls behind it, you see uh, the work of an, um, a very important artist called Rosemary Trockel, uh, who made this abstraction uh, that look like uh, abstraction at first, but to me, they almost look like computer screens or this digital noise that you will see, but actually as you get close to them, they're made of wool. And so she's also rethinking, and, and again, a sort of technique, uh, which is you know, the idea of uh, weaving, uh, but from a very digital perspective, because they're all made with a sort of electronic uh, loom. So again, playing with assumption of what a woman artwork should be. Uh, and then before, I finish, I want to um, just mention uh, one of the uh, sort of um, unique aspects of this, of the structure of the exhibition was the idea of um, punctuating the exhibition with five <clears throat> smaller exhibitions within the exhibition. I call them historical capsules, uh, and they were in the sort of journey of the exhibition, uh, but they were designed to be completely different. And they brought together the work of um, many, many artists, mostly from the uh, 19th century and early 20th century. Uh, they were all women artists, and in a way they, um, they function as this uh, time capsule that would bring back the, um, the viewer to uh, another time, another space, another geography, with artists, though, looking at very similar themes and concerns and preoccupations like the rest of the exhibition. So uh, this presentation, which was the first one that the audience saw, was called uh, The Witch's Cradle, which is a title of one of the works in the presentation. But in this case, uh, the artists um, thought about issues of metamorphosis and transformation, and also uh, how uh, nature takes over the human body. Here you have sort of one of the vitrines with the more 
sort of precious works, uh, someone like Remedios Varo, who you have, of whom you have an amazing example uh, downstairs, but also Leonora Carrington, um, and many other colleagues that were uh, what we call now the female surrealists, uh, but they work next to uh, their male parts without ever getting any sort of uh, recognition during their lifetime. Uh, but then uh, they were put together also uh, next to artists that were not part of surrealism, they might have been uh, part of the futurist mo mo movement or just not necessarily um, part of one specific uh, movement. But I, the goal of this presentation was to create, uh, put together a constellation of artworks from different geographies and different time that would evoke the same themes of the show, would also interrogate the sort of centrality of certain art histories that we've all Learn, but we all know how the story ended. Uh, and so creating assonances and rhymes among different generations, uh, also in a process of uh, reinscribing artists, or like this kind of um, exercise in uh, questioning what came before us and not thinking that art history is something that is fixed, it's a given, it can never be changed, but uh, interrogating what we've been told, what museums have told us, but also what institutions like the Venice Biennale have told us or have not told us uh, when it came to these uh, movements and these disciplines. And again, thinking about history as an ebullient and effervescent uh, platform where um, artists can always go back to. So uh, one of the goals of these presentations was to think that um, a biennale or a biennale doesn't necessarily always have to focus on the contemporary, but the contemporary can feed of the past and this exercise in uh, communications and dialogue and collaboration between uh, the past and the current are, is a way to move uh, forward. So um, I think I'm gonna wrap it up soon because I have another million of slides, but I, we're almost there. I'm gonna continue showing some images uh, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Yes. Oh, oh, that's a lot of slides. Okay. So bear with me. <laughs> Think about questions. If you don't have questions, I'm going to keep going. Um, any questions? <laughs> ah, I'll go back to Simon Lee. It's always nice. Uh, <laughs> so this was, as you think of questions, please do. This was uh, another sculpture by Simon Lee. Um, who actually I commissioned for the Highland. This was on view on the Highland from 2019 to 2021. Uh, it's called Brick House, and it's also part of this series called Anatomy of Architecture, in which she combines um, parts of, uh, of, of, the, of the body of, of a black woman, usually is the, the head and the, the, the face and the head, with the torso that resembles uh, a skirt or like an architectural form uh, inspired by West African um, architectures. And it was very interesting for me to show this piece, which was built and conceived for the outdoors as the entry, entrance to the second venue of the Biennale, which is called the Arsenale, uh, which, uh, where the, the sculpture became much more intimate, and I think there was a much more intimate uh, atmosphere that was created also uh, with the dialogue, with the works by Balki Sayon all around it. Um, but I will continue because I gotta go all the way to the end to show you a quote. <laughs> Let's see. Um, the quote I'm going to is, uh, uh, a quote that I think summarizes uh, why we're here. Um, and while the show has been generally well received, uh, one article reviewing the show um, ended like this. And okay, this was the Financial Times. Uh, so she goes, by choosing almost exclusively women, Alemani has paid a severe price in terms of quality, a cost obvious too in the contrast with many superb exhibitions by male artists across town. 
And so, um, <laughs> yes. So it was, I would say that most of the interviews that I, or the questions that I received during those you know, opening days, but also in the month following, uh, were often about why so many women artists. And you know, there is also a very different uh, take or position, America versus the old uh, Europe. Oh, I think we're much more advanced here, so we should be grateful to the work that museums like this do for our society and never consider it as a given because you know it can be like it can be bad <laughs> so in places like like in Italy for instance the reception of the show was very problematic because uh, a lot of critics could not could not entertain the fact that a show would showcase so many women artists and it was often dismissed because of that. So there was no desire to engage in the conversation, which can be an uncomfortable conversation, like it's been an uncomfortable conversation for so many of us for decades of show driven by uh, male artists. But, um, and so something like this did not come as a surprise, although of course, the worst critics are women. Um, so <laughs> that someone like the Financial Times could say, could still think that the quality of an exhibition, uh, that you get less quality because you're showcasing women artists. So this is a, something special I show every lecture I give. <laughs> Never to forget. During the process of curation, did you get feedback or pushback at the time from anybody Well, I, the process was really not just secretive because it's confidential, but also I think most of the people forgot that I was doing the Venice Biennale because it was such a, such a unique uh, and extreme time of isolation. You know, I, it was really weird. It was very strange. I was completely alone doing this. I mean, I talked to a lot of, a million people through, but it wasn't, there was no, you know, press conference. It was very different than the usual one. So I think not so, not so much in the preparation, but for sure in the fruition of the show. Um, but also, there were, I mean, most of people just enjoyed the exhibition for what it was. It wasn't a show about women artists, you know. But there was uh, certainly some pushback, mostly from European critics. Yes. I was wondering if the demographics of the attendees had shifted as a result of this. Did you get like many more men because they were curious? You know, I don't know if uh, we captured that, but it was the most visited Venice Biennale since its beginning. <laughs> so, it was 35% more than the previous one, um, even though, I mean, it's hard to imagine, but this, when we opened, it was still COVID time. You know, I was, I was wearing a mask. It was, you know, it was not an easy time. Like, we didn't have any anyone visiting from Asia because it was still very very hard to travel, but it was uh, the most visited. So I hope that's a good sign. I, I, we didn't count uh, boys and girls, but <laughs> it, was, uh, it was certainly well attended. Yes? Has anybody wondered uh, why so many in the exhibition and not, not equal percentage of women participating? I mean, you know, depends what you mean by equal. And I was, why? why? <laughs> There was a question about women and not previously yeah. men. That's a very, that's very, that's a, that's a very good question. It creates such a big buzz about. Because I think when it comes to women, then it becomes a women's show. And in the past, it's never been a men's show, although it was a men's show. But it's, uh, and I was very careful ne never to, you know, it was not an exhibition about women. The, the, most of the artists happened to be women, but you know, the themes of the, sh they were like a clear curatorial framework. But I think, so my emphasis wasn't necessarily on that for different reasons, but still that was very picked up because it was, <laughs> I think it was very different from previous exhibitions. And yeah. Yeah, I'm a curator and organizing exhibitions with women only. Not only, but um, I never heard such a weird reaction of why women only. Yeah, because it's about women and women's lives, mm -hmm. and it's referred to um, uh, the project I'm doing, um, 
long lasting and it's referred to women since uh, uh, the Penelope times from Odysseus uh, <laughs> poem of Homer until nowadays and how their uh, lives are developing through the years. Mm -hmm. So I've never have had any similar reactions. Yeah. So I wonder what this happened to you. I mean, it's also like, I, I would say in general, it was very, very well received, the exhibition. I'm being picky. <laughs> but, but since we are in the context of, uh, of the music. The yeah, yeah, yeah. But the reception. Uh, yes, the concept. Uh, yes, it's women's, a women's exhibition about women's lives. I think that. because it's still very hard for people to, to talk about it, <laughs> like very simply. And it's uncomfortable and it makes you all of a sudden, you know, there were lots of galleries that were not so happy because then it's like, oh, how many women do you represent in your roster? Maybe you have three out of 20. So I think there is a, this sort of fear that the criticism will hit you at some point. Although it wasn't necessarily a critical show, but, um, you know, I think to me, and I was talking uh, to a colleague just before saying that, there was an artist called uh, Mirella Bentivoglio, who is also, she's an Italian artist who is also in the collection of the museum here, who in the 70s, besides being an amazing artist, she was in my show in Venice, besides being uh, an amazing artist, uh, um, she was also a curator, or at that point, I don't know if we would call them curator. So in 1978, she was invited to do a show in Venice, part of the Venice Biennale Umbrella, that was called materialization del linguaggio or materialization of language. She was a visual, um, a, a visual poetry artist. And uh, she brought together a show only of women artists working in visual and concrete poetry, which was uh, labeled as a ghetto biennial uh, because it was just female artists. Uh, but she was like, to me, her approach was very inspiring because since the early 70s, she had been curating exhibitions of women artists working in the concrete and visual poetry field uh, across Europe because she realized that in that specific, that movement, which was very important in, uh, in Italy as it was in you know, South America and in the Netherlands, uh, there were amazing women artists, but none of them was ever featured in this large scale exhibition that happened in the 70s. So she made a point of curating exhibitions of women artists working in that language. Uh, and she had a very pragmatic approach. She said, at the beginning of the 70s, it was usually one or 2% of women in these shows. After I've done these amazing books and exhibitions, the percentage went up to 10%. So admitting that it was a lot of ignorance also happening of not knowing female voices because maybe they were not part of the regular circuit where curators or museum organizers would see art. I'm gonna go backwards, but. <laughs> I think that is our, our cue. Um, I really appreciate all of the wonderful um, questions, thoughtful attention. We now have a wonderful Sunday supper uh, down in our great hall. So I encourage you all, well, first, let's thank Julia for <laughs> Um, and also the menu is taking inspiration from Cecilia herself, oh, um, and Venice and Alex. So. <laughs>